All right, so welcome everybody to our December edition of the Holy Cross Institute monthly webinar series, which this year is uh, based on the theme of forming citizens for this world and for heaven. So we welcome you this evening. We thank you for taking time in your busy schedules, especially with the holiday season approaching um, during the season of Advent. Uh, we know that many of you who are working in schools, you're probably winding down. Those of you in higher education maybe have already turned your grades in already. Um, and your break has just begun. Uh, so again, we thank you. We thank you for taking time tonight. Um, as uh, we're gonna give ourselves a minute or two to allow people to get in uh, to this evening's presentation. And, uh, but we invite you as we always do to please use your chat. Let us know who you are, where you're, where you're coming from. We always enjoy seeing, uh, we've got people from all over the world that tap into these monthly webinars. So please use your chat and let us know who you are. All right, we want to thank everybody. Ann Westdyke, who's here at St. Ed's, and Ed O'Connell from Connecticut, Sarah Hensler coming to us. I missed it. Mike Truesdale from Holy Cross High School in Queens, New York. Mike, thank you for joining us. Sarah Hens uh, Hensler is a professor of psychology at St. Edward's. So thank you, Sarah, uh, for being with us this evening. Um, David Spriggs coming to us from Temple, Texas. Thank you. Fantastic. Sister Elaine from Merrimack, New, uh, New Hampshire. Thank you again, Sister Elaine. Always good to, uh, to have you with us. Brother Richard Daly is here as well. Thank you, brother, for joining us. Sister Emily from St. Mary's at Notre Dame. Um, very grateful, Sister, for your support and for your involvement and for being on here tonight. It's fantastic. All right, well, again, welcome to the December edition of the Holy Cross Institute webinar series, our monthly webinar series, which we began in the 2020-2021 academic year in celebration of the 200th anniversary of the Brothers of St. Joseph. Uh, that first year series was so popular that we have continued it into a second year now. And this year's theme is based on a quote that comes from Father Moreau. I, and it's the theme is forming citizens for this world and for heaven. And as we talk about citizenship, tonight's uh, program is really a, a special program for us. We're delighted, very honored to have with us Dr. David Thomason and some students from his civics lab, which he'll tell you a little bit more later on. But I think as we all know, we are living in a highly polarized society today. And, um, and we're all struggling to find ways to, to bring people together, to communicate, to um, to be collegial, to, to engage in dialogue that is grace-filled and productive. And um, I, something that I, I mentioned to the group that, that was on just before everybody came on, I'm, I'm currently reading a book by Anne Garrido uh, called Redeeming Conflict. And if you've not um, read the book or read anything from Anne, Anne's a theologian at Dominican University. And um, I presentations actually for the Holy Cross Institute in the past, and, and we hope we'll do so again. But she says that if we're serious about teaching people how to handle conflict constructively with grace and discernment, curiosity and skill, it seems to me we need to be modeling how to do that as faculty and staff. So, so much of tonight's program is really all about how to model that as faculty and staff, how to model that in our daily life and our daily witness, how to model that with the upcoming Christmas holidays around the Christmas dinner table with family and friends and relatives. Um, and so, AJ, we want to go ahead and advance the next slide. Again, uh, for those that don't know me, Marco Clark, I'm the Executive Director of the Holy Cross Institute. This is my second year in this position and really quite an honor for me to, to serve in this role. Um, as you know, we're located at St. Edwards and, and what we do is, is we serve as a center at St. Edwards University, as an institute at St. Edwards University, where we, um, we do research, uh, we conduct research, we develop resources, we conduct these webinar series, prayers, we, we put on conferences. The big conference that we host each year is the Convocation, which will take place again in person this year, March 24th through the 26th. We do workshops, sometimes on site, on location, sometimes here at St. Ed's, and, and we provide a whole series of professional services. As well, we, we put great emphasis on developing leaders for Holy Cross, mission-driven leaders for Holy Cross. Additionally, we provide executive coaching. 
uh, and, and for those who are emerging, emerging and aspiring leaders. And then ultimately, as a network of this family of Holy Cross, which is composed of more than 120 schools, colleges, and universities around the world, 21 countries, we know that through our unity, we can move direct and sanctify the whole world. You can follow us on social media. You can see Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube as well. Um, uh, you can subscribe to our daily, our monthly newsletter. Um, AJ can drop into the chat for you the link to sign up for our monthly e-newsletter. And, um, and as well, we remind you that the, we have a free prayer app, the Daily Moreau Prayer app, currently available in the Google Play Store and in process, almost nearing completion, available in the Apple App Store. We'll have that out to you very soon. We're also reminded that when Holy Cross was founded, when the Brothers of St. Joseph began their work more, now more than 200 years ago, and then when Holy Cross was founded, we were founded really with the idea that, that there was the, the need for restoration and transformation of the church and society. It was a broken time. It was a broken time in history uh, in France. And, um, and Father Moreau and, and uh, Father Dujarier and the, the early Brothers of St. Joseph and the sisters that that as well were doing the work um, throughout France, they saw Christian education as an answer. And, and the concept, the idea was to bring people together of different backgrounds, um, have them learn together with one another and from one another. And again, as we face today, um, very similar uh, uh, levels of division and despair, discouragement. Um, again, Christian education, Catholic education, the kind of education that we provide in Holy Cross can be the answer to, to, to finding truth and, and can be the answer to the restoration of the church and society. Next slide, please, AJ. We're gonna get started with our prayer. I asked my assistant director, Megs Turgeon, to lead us in prayer. Megs wrote this. This is a special prayer that was developed for this year with our particular focus throughout the year on Catholic social teaching. So Megs. Thank you so much, Dr. Clark. Um, as always, let's begin uh, this webinar in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, following the example of your Son, you have called us to participate in building your kingdom of justice, love, and peace. As we endeavor to do this work, we ask you to send forth your Spirit, our great helper, to infuse us with heavenly virtues. Instill in us, we pray, an abiding respect for human life and dignity, a firm resolve to serve our communities, a keen awareness of our responsibilities toward our neighbors, an unyielding commitment to the poor and vulnerable, a high regard for workers and the dignity of their labor, a deep-seated solidarity with the suffering and oppressed, and a benevolent spirit of stewardship over your creation. Rescue us, we pray, from the injustices we suffer and the injustices we inflict, so that as one human family, we may attain to the freedom and flourishing for which you have created us. Grant us, Father, the competence to see these injustices and the courage to act against them. This mission is yours, and so is the strength to accomplish it. Be with us, then, as we strive to be virtuous citizens of this present world, and as we train to become saintly citizens of your heavenly kingdom. We thank you in a special way for the gift of our speakers this evening. We ask your blessing upon them. Grant them the gifts of wisdom, eloquence, and conviction that they may inspire us to action on your behalf. Grant us, their listeners, eyes to see and ears to hear. We ask this and all things through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Fantastic, Meg. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful prayer. Um, again, as we get started, uh, we want to thank our sponsor uh, for this particular event, Nonprofit Sector Strategies. Um, they work with nonprofit organizations. Uh, we use them through the Holy Cross Institute for a particular uh, portal that's called Bell's Board. Um, and it's a portal that we use for all of our board meetings, board minutes, 
um, our, uh, all of our record keeping bylaws, everything is handled inside of a, a, of a portal, a secure portal. And um, so we really wanna thank our friends from Nonprofit Sector Strategies for their support to the Holy Cross Institute. And we invite companies, businesses, or individuals to support um, the Holy Cross Institute. Uh, we offer all of our programs, as you know, free of charge um, to all of our attendees. And we do that because of the generosity of good people like all of you. And so we wanna thank you for your support. Next slide. And then we remind you that this uh, is being recorded and will be sent out to all of you tomorrow. And then it will be um, on our YouTube channel. It will live there on our YouTube channel, something that you can share with your communities, of course. As we go through the night, if you've got any questions, we ask that you drop them into your chat box. If you have any technical difficulties, you can contact hci at stedwards.edu um, or raise your hand and AJ will get to you. Um, and as I mentioned, that recorded and most importantly, enjoy. We know that you're really gonna benefit from tonight's great program. Next slide. We also, okay, we'll come to that at the end. So um, uh, Dr. Thomason, Amy and Michael, if you could go ahead and turn your cameras on. Tonight represents just an amazing collaboration, um, interdisciplinary work here at St. Edwards University as we look to expand um, I to work together uh, to share the good news of Holy Cross education and how Holy Cross education is and can be. Um, I, uh, the, the, the act of the work of resurrection um, that, uh, that Moreau wrote about. And so we're delighted tonight to have with us Dr. David Thomason, um, who is a professor at St. Edwards University and two of his students who are gonna share more with us about how they, um, by example, are helping to um, engage in dialogue I, during this terribly polarized time in history. And so Dr. Thomason, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Clark. And I just wanna, first of all, just say thanks to everyone here on the, the call uh, and to the Holy Cross Institute. Um, you know, Dr. Clark and I have actually been visiting about, about uh, the overall goals and direction of civics as a key component of this year's uh, mission. And uh, it was, it's been it's been great to, to have those conversations with him, and I just really appreciate um, the opportunity to do this tonight. Um, and uh, thanks to to AJ for the work he's put in on this. I know he did a lot of work, and um, you know Meg's prayer actually um, reminds me of something that uh, just kind of started off. Um, I teach political theory, and so a lot of the conversations I have are around. Um, St. Thomas Aquinas, and that prayer reminded me a little bit of Aquinas, uh, especially with the relationship between eternal natural law um, and the idea that there is this relationship between the, the goals we have as citizens in this world and our long-term uh, goals as citizens of heaven. Um, I, as, uh, as we know, that's a, a key piece of what uh, Basil Moreau said, and uh, it used to be actually in my Twitter account. It was my my quote that I had in my Twitter account. So, um, you know, tonight I want to talk about civics, and I'm going to lay out basically some some elements, some uh, a kind of a general theory, and then the two students that are here tonight will talk about what what we're doing with a, a project that we call the Civics Lab here at St. Ed's, um, and then we'll come back and have a a, a general conversation. Um, so let me go ahead and and walk through some some uh, some key sort of theoretical elements around around civics. As we all know, civics in America is in disarray, um, and it's it's a subject that for for most uh, has been uh, what seemed to be a very mundane subject, but also a necessary component of an organized society and in, 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 in Western thought. Um, one of the questions that, that I always think about and, and raise with my students is in this contemporary uh, focus of civics, how can we protect the diversity of values and ideas in a free society while also identifying places where we share in a common language and identity? In other words, how do we find places where we can respect the dignity of each person and have tolerance towards others, but at the same time, uh, work towards 
a common collaborative identity and language that we can agree to in, in a public space. You know, the state of civics in America is filled with tremendous amount of partisanship, especially in the last year. Uh, we've seen state legislatures, city councils, school boards are often at odds over how we should teach and engage students in strong democratic citizenship. Um, mu much of this has actually transpired around these issues of, of uh, what is the curriculum? What should be the curriculum in schools? Uh, for many, there's a, a, a uh, this this idea that somehow schools are diverging away from what are the foundations of the American um, principles and are moving into areas that are um, challenging some of those basic foundations uh, where they call um, they call the idea of this the critical race theory um, uh, criticism uh, and and so many in state legislatures city councils school boards have passed legislation and bills trying to uh, for lack of just sort of a, a better word, sort of weeding out the critical race components. Um, but uh, civics education is, is not, it's at a significant turning point and a significant place of tension uh, under two pieces here. Uh, do, do we return to a set of foundational values that could exclude and deny some from participation? Or do we embrace aspirational values that challenge some of the assumptions about the American founding. And I think a lot about this in terms of um, how we describe our basic under our basic um, places of agreement. On the one hand, sometimes we think of it as these are these agreements are places of foundation, that they're foundational. On the other hand, we often think about these as aspirational. And um, I think there's a big difference between these as we'll go through in a little bit, but one is more static. A foundation implies a very bedrock sort of, it, it, it is and will be. Uh, whereas aspirational implies that it's not yet achieved, but we still have that dream of achieving those values. And so I just would challenge you to think about how we view civics. Do we view civics as a place of foundation, do we provide a foundation, or do we think of civics as more aspirational? Um, you know, one of the one of the things when we think about civics and just generally the American um, uh, citizens and institutions of our political system is American trust in almost everything is in decline. Um, and this is not this is not revelationary here. We, we know this has been going on since uh, the Vietnam War and Watergate, there's been a reduction or the, the amount of trust that citizens have in government. Um, people don't trust the media. People don't trust government. People don't trust each other. Uh, there was a story just this month in the Atlantic Monthly that talks about how trust is sort of the bedrock of all of our basic foundational or, or all of our basic relations with each other whether they're economic, social, uh, political, you know, the idea of trust is a key component to how we interact with each other. Um, and that, that decline of trust, as, the, as this article suggested, leads to many problems with respect to how we interact with one another in the business world, in the academic world, um, the political world, you know, socially, in the entertainment world. Um, and as, um, as they say, you know, without this, Adam Smith's invisible hand uh, stays in the pocket. And uh, uh, Kane's animal spirits are muted. And in fact, as um, Kenneth Arrow says, virtually every commercial transaction has within itself an element of trust. Um, so how do we build trust? Uh, how do we build trust? Does it just magically appear for some reason, I thought of um, the Wizard of Oz, where you just, you know, Dorothy just clicks her heels together and just magically she's transported back to, to Kansas. You know, is it is trust something that we just, if we just try hard enough and think hard enough, we're going to build it back up? Well, I would suggest that that is not the case. That trans, that trust is actually um, the product of a number of elements that are underlying how we, how we reach trust. 
Uh, just think, just really quickly, think about if you walk onto a used car lot and um, you know there's a car on the lot there and the salesman comes out and says, you like the car? Yes, I like the car. Um, well, why don't you, why don't, here's the price you do want to buy it. Trust me. Very unlikely that you're going to trust them. You want to have certain things checked off. You want to verify those things. You want to go and maybe check the car out. You want to, you know, drive it. Um, you want to look at the blue book value. You want to get a mechanic to come in, maybe an independent mechanic. Um, and all those things build towards how we then create a healthy relationship with that salesperson. Um, this is no different than any other relationship that we have, from whether it's a doctor, attorney, uh, teacher, student relationship, uh, coaches. You know, the world is full of places where we need to have things underlying those politician to constituent, and and uh, I won't go into the long the long version of this, but you're welcome to take my class, uh, my American government class, because my students are. Uh, able to go through this uh, endlessly throughout the semester. But my argument is basically, in order for us to have a healthy level of trust, in order for democracy to flourish, we need three pillars. And those three pillars are, we need accountability in both the institutions and those elected officials in the institutions, in the media, citizen to citizen. We need transparency and how we interact with one another and how those institutions are transparent and how the elected officials are transparent and in the accessibility of those institutions and those elected officials and the media. If we don't have those, these are all necessary, but alone are not sufficient. We need all three. And if one of those three are absent, then democracy is unstable. And these products, this, these three pillars lead us to uh, a healthy trust. Trust requires civic virtues. Trust requires responsible citizenship. And I'm going to suggest tonight, as I do in all my classes and in the civics lab, that our loss of trust um, can be won back through creativity and reimagining our civics discourse and action. Uh, reimagining citizenship can help to rebuild these, these three pillars and can lead to um, a regeneration of trust in our society. Um, and so the question there is, well, how? Um, so let's, let's talk just for a, a little bit about what we mean by civics and civics virtues. Um, first of all, civics is a broad category and um, most operate under the idea that civics has different components. Um, we have the knowledge you know, the basic understanding of our, our system and how, how it operates and how to vote and uh, various elements of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, uh, our rights as citizens, our obligations as citizens, uh, how to serve on a jury, these sorts of things. But then there is the more participatory and intellectual variety of skills. So uh, these include things like, how do I vote? Where do I vote? How do I uh, access information? What is valid forms of information? What are invalid? Can we distinguish and do we have a, a, a basis of distinguishing between propaganda that's manipulating us versus information that's being uh, distributed in a way that's helpful and constructive for us to make informed decisions? Um, and the same is true with participatory skills on things like how do I set up a meeting with my member of Congress or how do I run for office? Uh, these are elements of civic uh, intellectual skills. And then the third is the civic disposition. And this was more about entrepreneurship and creativity. How do I engage in the social, economic, democratic life in ways that will enhance and further and develop my own interests first in conjunction with others? So in concert, these components are what we think of in general as our essential elements of civics education, knowledge, the skills of uh, participation, and then the creativity to apply ourselves um, in the civics world. These are very much in line with what we call civic virtues. 
Um, civic virtues essentially are our dispositions for behavior in an open and free society. Uh, civic virtue is very much embedded in the idea of what um, Aristotle and other Greeks describe as arete or virtue or excellence. Um, as Aristotle said, you know, the idea of us fulfilling our purpose and, and, and seeing our purpose unfold is an essential element of our becoming a virtuous or, or excellent person. And citizenship for Aristotle was, if not the highest, one of the highest uh, components of us as a social animal. Um, you know, the idea of civic virtue implies that there is an element of civil religion associated with this virtue, that there are symbols and mess and and there are places of overlapping uh, agreement that we can adopt and agree to. Um, things like voting, volunteering, uh, attending PTA meetings, uh, these are all very important parts of developing what we call a civic virtue. Um, just a real brief idea of where some of these ideas of, of civics and civics education, um, where I come from on this. Uh, I'm very influenced by the idea of Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America, uh, where de Tocqueville lays out what he calls enlightened self-interest, or what, what, what we call self-interest rightly or properly understood. Um, he came to the United States to study actually the, the prison system in the U.S. and ended up writing Democracy in America, um, in addition to his writings on the, the prison system in America. Uh, but for de Tocqueville, we're, we are citizens that are driven by our own self-interest, but that self-interest is drives us to form associations, to form relationships with others, to move ourselves out of what he calls our narrow circle of family and friends and into a world where we're not like everyone else, where there is a diversity of views, values, backgrounds, and so on. And we're placed in positions where we're not in agreement with each other on some of the fundamental basic ideas that we think is the good life. So how do we communicate and how do we find places of agreement in places where we may have fundamental disagreements on what we think is the good or the good life? And de Tocqueville says that in America, one of the driving forces of the American democracy is that Americans form associations. We, we see and we work together in an association of churches, civic groups, uh, uh, small group uh, PTAs, uh, you know, places where we interact. And those are how, that's how American democracy is successful because it draws us out of what we would normally think of in a narrow self-interest, self what, what he would call a narrow self-interest and into a broader self-interest. Um, but self-interest is at the core of this. The danger that de Tocqueville notes is that there's a narrow self-interest that many are withdrawn and easily withdrawn from the public space. Uh, and when they withdraw from public, the public space, it is someone will fill the power vacuum. And de Tocqueville argues that this can be filled by someone, a tyrant or authoritarian, even the tyranny of the majority that benefit selfishly from the separation or distrust among citizens. And so de Tocqueville pleads with those that are interested in democracy to continue to move yourself into places of diversity, not move yourself away from diversity. John Stuart Mill makes a similar point um, in, his, in his work on liberty. Mill was concerned with this idea of a creeping despotism that pervaded societies of equals. Um, the despotism that he says could be from a singular person or from what he calls the tyranny of the majority. And to combat that, Mill, as does to Tocqueville, implores citizens to remain active and not simply accept the majority as correct, nor squelch the minority just because of its position in society. And, um, so kind of going forward, you know, a little bit over a hundred years, John Rawls, who wrote a book called Theory of Justice and and later in the um, early 90s wrote, wrote a book called late night or mid 90s wrote a book called political liberalism, basically argues for a theory of what he calls uh, an overlapping consensus. 
And just the short version of Rawls basically is, imagine in this thought experiment that all of us could somehow detach ourselves from the basic elements that define us as a person. So, uh, you know, gender, race, uh, intellect, athletic ability, physical ability, uh, you know, wealth, uh, all of the things that, that would define a person. And in the veil of ignorance, we don't know what characteristics we have. We don't know if we're, when the veil is lifted, that we'll be wealthy, that we'll be poor, that we'll be smart, that we won't be so smart, uh, that we'll be athletic, we'll be, you know, we're not, we don't know if we're gonna be LeBron James, you know? Um, so we don't know where we're gonna land in this veil of ignorance. Um, so under that, he says, we basically create these principles. And those principles, he, he, he says, will be places where we will say when the veil is lifted, we will be treated fairly under these principles. And those are things that he calls these overlapping consensus. Um, and in democracy, Rawls argues, we can find consensus between diverse groups of people, so long as those diverse groups are both reasonable and rational. Groups that are not reasonable or rational, that are irrational or unreasonable may undermine this consensus. So part of our responsibility as citizens for Rawls and others uh, is to determine when groups are unreasonable and when they're irrational. But really the question there is who decides what's unreasonable and what's unrational. If I'm unreasonable and irrational, I'm probably not gonna say I'm unreasonable and irrational. I'm probably gonna tell you I'm very rational, I'm very reasonable and you're unreasonable and you're irrational. Um, you know, so do we decide by community standards? Do we decide by court? Do we decide by majority? Who decides? Um, in 2000, Robert Putnam wrote a book called Bowling Alone, which I'm sure many of you are very familiar with and probably familiar with all the other pieces that I've gone through tonight already. Uh, but, but Putnam argues that a healthy, open and free society needs to build what he calls social capital. And social capital is this connection between citizens in a community. So places of social capital have strong relationships with quality of life, improved health and safety measures, communities are healthier. The danger that Putnam's social capital can lead to though, is we can lead to exclusion. So if there's social capital that's built up, when someone new comes into the community or there's, there's someone that isn't in that group and that network in the, the wagons that have been circled, then that is a threat and that can potentially lead to uh, groupthink in an echo chamber un underneath the social capital. So the, the, the benefit of social capital is it helps build strong relationships in the community. The danger of social capital is it can be exclusionary if not taken, um, not taking into account the necessity of diverse voices. The last work that I wanna bring up is a work that's just recently been written in 2020 by Ruth ben Giat, And ben Giat argues that authoritarian regimes in her book, Strong Men, Mussolini to the Present. Her argument is fascinating. I would highly recommend this book. Um, she argues that authoritarian regimes from Mussolini to the, the present uh, time period, um, uh, that authoritarian regimes thrive when people cannot distinguish between valid information and propaganda. That's part of her argument. Um, and that we need valid ways, we need ways to distinguish between those. And a strong citizen, uh, Strong civics education, part of that strong civics education is about the intellectual disposition towards or the intellectual skills of distinguishing. And so as a civic, as civics education, we, a big part of it is distinguishing between valid and invalid between propaganda and manipulative information and valid information. Democratic health assumes that individuals are autonomous about their own interests and that they're equal. So we assume in, in a democracy that people are self-interested and that they're pursuing their own interests uh, with their own self-rule, with autonomy. Uh, but we also assume in a democracy the idea that there's equality. And one of the arguments I make in my classes very frequently is that equality takes priority to liberty. And let me, let me say that again. I, I would argue that equality takes priority to liberty. And here's, here's why I would argue that. When we think of uh, like a freeway or highway, if we're on the highway by ourselves, 
I know, I know for me, uh, for most of us, if we're on a, if we're in a congestion, if traffic congestion is a nightmare headache, but when the road's clear, we love it. I mean, I would much rather have a, a highway that is my own sort of my place where I can drive freely whenever I want to. But we also know it's a public good and restricting someone from being able to get onto that freeway is a problem. So I can't benefit from that freeway until I have access to that freeway. I can't benefit from Liberty until I have the equality of getting access to that, to that place. When it, in this case, I define quality as access to a good. Um, we can't benefit from the freedoms that are in place unless we have access to those freedoms. Um, so citizenship, I would argue, means both competing and collaborating. So in civics education, we need to be building good citizens that recognize self-interest and competition is good. We also need to recognize that collaboration is good, similar to what the Tocqueville says about self-interest rightly understood. The questions that, that I always ask, and it's the question that I'll ask all of us, is can we move away from a zero-sum approach in politics where one group benefits and competes to the disadvantage of another group, you know, and, and or can we move to a non-zero sum that seeks to collaborate and solve problems in the public space, in public policy? And I would say that civics education, we must do better in collaborating and recognizing competition in that collaboration, but working towards non-zero sum outcomes. So let me talk about the civics lab, and then I'm going to have the students jump in here. Um, so, follow, so our civics lab basically started just a few years ago. We started with a podcast. Um, Dr. Clark actually was nice enough to come on to the podcast last year. Um, but we've just started this year uh, a very active, experiential-based um, learning lab, where basically we work with outside groups um, and public policy questions and seek to solve those problems. And so students work very collaboratively with um, policymakers, decision makers in the community um, to do what Mill describes as uh, the skills of citizenship are like muscles. We must exercise them to see improvements and benefits. Um, so I want to talk, I want to let the students come in here and talk about what some of the things that we did in Civics Lab this fall and how those help us to exercise our skills of citizenship. And then some of the unexpected set of outcomes that come from that um, when we create uh, connections in ways in the community that we weren't necessarily expecting. So here's a few things from the students. Um, Amy Calhoun and Michael Baumgartner are here on the call. Um, and Amy, do you mind starting? And then Michael, do you wanna come in after Amy? Yeah, hi guys, thanks for being here. So this semester in Civics Lab, our group chose to focus on making public transportation more accessible to the general population. So we kind of broke off into a few different groups. We had a government relations group, a grassroots team, a media team, and just kind of were able to take the things that we had learned from Dr. Thompson from our other civics courses and apply them to a practical problem that we were facing as students and that we believed the community of Austin was facing. Michael, you want to go ahead? Yeah. Um, thank you, Amy. And thank you, Dr. Thompson, as well as Dr. Clark and everyone else for inviting us. Um, my name is Mike Bumgartner, as Dr. Thomason said, and exactly what Amy sort of said, what we did this fall was take a look at an issue. We actually started by having a group conversation. I think that's what this is really going to come down to is the biggest thing you can learn, the biggest thing about the civics education, everything Dr. Thomason said is we have to work at a team to identify the correct problem. And that was the very first thing we got down to business with doing, and that turned out to be uh, transportation, which is obviously a, a huge thing to discuss if you're just, even in the Austin area, for those who are joining from afar, there's discussions on trains, there's discussion on buses, there's discussion on electric vehicles, and we really tried our best to tackle all of it, but we're only one semester. So over time, we have to prioritize. We have to even further narrow and say, basically, we have to educate ourselves so that we can better 
determine what we can particularly go after. So by the time this semester ended, we set up the groundwork and the infrastructure for the next team to step in and start to work with our school on things like bus pass access and working with some train with some coalitions that we got through some of the companies. And I think that's a huge part of what we need to focus on going forward as a whole in civics education is just trying to identify the right problem because you can spend a lot of time. <laughs> it's one of the most interesting things you'll learn is you can spend an unbelievable amount of time trying to figure out just what the people need. And by the time you get done with that, you're halfway through your semester. And that's a really important lesson I think we all learned. We also were able to take an issue that we really didn't know much about. Really none of the students did. Nobody had really utilized public transportation for what it was in Austin. And it's not something that we really would have learned outside of class. And so we were able to take a new issue and just kind of take it from a foundational aspect to say, okay, here is something that is the entire community is struggling with. People have lost trust in public transportation. They've lost trust in our government's ability to provide this good to them or provide this service to them. And so how can we change that? And how can we build back that trust? And what we really learned was that it started with educating ourselves on how public transportation worked, what kind of services were involved. And so we were able to set up meetings with CAP Metro, which allowed us to practice those skills of, hey, here's a representative that is somebody that has an input on this and how do I get a meeting with them? And then, so we learned how their offices are set up, how the politics behind meeting with your representatives are and what goods they wanna be involved in and what kind of stuff they want their office to be involved in. And then we're able to take that and come back to our group and kind of present that to say, hey, here is the architect of that works with Cap Metro that's designing this new transportation system. Here's what they say. And here's what our city council thinks about it. So then how do we combine what's actually happening with the politics behind what's happening? And how do we make that palatable for the public? And then what else do we need to learn in order to be an advocate for this and advocate for ourselves to have better, better public goods and better public services. You know, one thing, what, when we started this project on transportation, it wasn't necessarily the top choice for everybody in the class. Um, it wasn't even my top choice. Uh, you know, I, I had some ideas about what I thought we should do, but we worked together to come up with we collaborated, we talked about what we wanted to do, we came up with this idea, and we actually ended up riding the bus several times uh, from St. Anne's to different locations. Um, do you want to talk about that? Because this is one of the elements that I think is the byproduct of when you get out of your the university setting or the, the classroom and you're in the community, you see things in a lot of different way. Do you want to talk about going on the bus? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So you know, as Amy just said, one of the first things we had to do was educate ourselves. And yes, we've had meetings, we've discussed things with people, but the best way to educate for myself, and everyone's different, but I think for the majority of folks who are in the class, was this experiential learning perspective, which was, how are we going to learn about mass transportation when none of us have been, when a, minor, a majority of us have not taken mass transit in the Austin area? Well, we got on the bus, we, we learned by going, and we got to talk to people who had to rely on the bus for their own commuter. You know, we spoke to some bus drivers. Well, the first place we went was to a big open house with Capital Metro, the company that is backing the majority of the mass transit system in Austin, trains, planes, and well, no planes, but see, I was gonna use a good quote, but then it was gone. Trains and buses. and. Um, we were able to talk to them and, and really talk to folks that use the bus every day, folks that worked on the bus every day. And that was a great experience for everybody involved. And we had a lot of fun doing that too. Right, we had done a lot of background research. We looked at the bus routes, we had looked at new proposed routes and we had a really good idea of the system and the challenges and possible solutions on paper. 
And then we met about 30 minutes before we were supposed to get on the bus and walked over to the bus stop. And we're very confident in our abilities and very quickly learned that we were at the wrong bus stop. And that's not something we would have learned if we hadn't taken the practical approach to it and gone and actually rode the bus. And then while we were meeting with people at the CAP Metro event, we learned that there are a lot of other systems in place that we hadn't been able to find online. And you had to go and have those conversations and be able to actively discuss challenges and what we thought would be solutions to those challenges in order to learn that there was a whole other side to it that we couldn't find just by doing research in the classroom, that we needed that experiential learning in order to come up with a better solution. And we needed to involve more people than we thought would be valid participants in the project to begin with. And when we met with the Project Connect at the, the meeting they were having, you know, a lot of the, so we were just got off the bus and one of the questions that the students, and there were probably 20 or so students that were down at that event, is that they asked some of the uh, executives from um, Cap Metro and Project Connect if they rode public transportation. So we kind of did it in a way that wasn't like a direct sort of question, but more kind of generally. and. And what we found is a lot of them didn't actually take public transportation. So one thing that we ended up doing is we had a week where we had, we raised awareness. We called it the Topper Transit Challenge, uh, where we raised awareness. And I told students, basically, if y'all can get this, then I'll agree to, to ride the bus that week. And so I ended up riding my bike to the bus stop. And I, I what would normally take me about 20 minutes to get to campus ended up taking me about an hour and a half. Um, but I wanted to do that because you you can't, you learn by doing. And so do you wanna talk about the Topper Transit Challenge and some of the things that, that we did on that to raise awareness on campus and off campus? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for starters, we have these stickers, <laughs> which is um, for those of you who are joining, um, this is our mascot Topper. We put him on a bike with our hashtag Topper Transit. And we handed out stickers in that. The, we basically made it into a challenge. We said, this was the Topper Transit Challenge. What we wanted folks to do was ride the bus, take a walk, take your bike, use any sort of sustainable mass or sustainable transportation, take a picture of yourself, upload it to Twitter or Instagram, and tag us with this hashtag Topper Transit. And we entered the, those individuals into a a raffle of sorts, a raffle that we gave out a couple prizes at the basketball game. And I'll let Amy kind of talk about that experience, I think. Yeah. So one of the things that we learned from that was a lot of our students also didn't have any idea about public transportation. And so by giving them some sort of incentive to take a mode of transportation that wasn't them alone in their own vehicle, to get around Austin, it allowed them to learn more about the services available to them. And then it also brought people to our school's basketball game, which was wonderful. Um, but it really just showed us how little awareness there was about public services in our city. And it gave us an opportunity to teach others about them, to learn about them, and then to be able to be an advocate for something that the government or the city of Austin was providing for its citizens that people didn't know about and weren't utilizing. You know, and as the, as both of them pointed out, you know, it was very much built on, well, let's try this out, let's do this. Uh, one of the students that's not here, but she, she was planning on coming, but she had, she got called into work. She has to pay for her uh, Holy Cross education. So she's, she's working, but she did send me something. And I want to, I want to read this um, from her. She actually wrote an op-ed that was published in the Austin Express, uh, uh, the Austin, uh, Austin uh, Statesman, the Austin uh, American Statesman. She's from San Antonio, so I was thinking Express, but she, uh, she wrote an op-ed, she and I did, um, in the Austin American Statesman on the need to um, address climate change by reducing the amount of time we're in a car. So it's simple, easy, you know, simple to understand. And we did it during this Topper Transit Challenge during that week. 
Um, and it was in the Sunday, she wrote it, and it was actually in the Sunday paper as an op-ed. Um, it got a lot of comments, um, but it was a good way for us to kind of kick off that transit challenge. And so here's what, here's what Desi says. Her name's Desi Sakalis. She says, a Holy Cross education is personal. It's an education where you're not just a number, you're not just a name on a list. You're a valuable member of your academic community. People know your name and want to hear your story. I haven't truly felt or embodied these truths until I was part of the civics lab. Not only was I given the freedom to find my strengths, but I was also given the freedom to confront my weaknesses. The civics lab, just as the name implies, is a lab. We are set out to experiment and explore social and political ideas. And in turn, we experiment and explore with ourselves. We're able to learn from our mistakes and find pride in our achievements. This is something that is not only missing in political science, but in the Holy Cross education as a whole. Students in the class were given the space to find where they are best helpful. After some time, I learned that for me, that was in my writing. Through the opportunities in this course, uh, with the assistance of, of me, I was able to have an article published in the Austin American Statesman. This isn't something many 19-year-old sophomore college students have the honor to say. I likely wouldn't have been able to say this without joining this course. We need more of this, not only for political science, but all majors and all students. Experiential learning is the most valuable form of learning. We all know this and we shouldn't act on it. After having a small portion of the bounty that experiential learning has to offer, I want more. I want to be able to apply my, le my lectures, notes and papers to the, to the real world. This is where the real and good work is done. So how would y'all say, if you wanna sum up just very, just briefly, what, what, what could y'all take from this? experience um, this semester. It, and this is not the only class that, that both of you have had in experiential. We have, I teach another class called Legislative Process and Lobbying. We actually file a bill and work at the Capitol to pass legislation. But that's why I brought Michael and Amy in because they both are seasoned veterans in this world. But what, what can y'all take away from this? I think one of my biggest takeaways from specifically from the civics lab was I really learned that it's okay to fail. I think a lot of times, especially in a small university, it's a competitive environment and we want to do well. We want to have a good GPA. We want to be able to have good job interviews, do everything well after college. And it's very focused on your future after graduation. And my biggest takeaway from the civics lab was that it was an opportunity to try new things, to practice the skills that I will need after graduation in a real world environment. And it was okay that I wasn't great at it at first, but I was able to practice it and fail and learn and do better. And from that, I've been able to put things on my resume that have gotten me job interviews. I've been able to say that, yeah, I, met with a state senator about this issue and it forms that connection with his office that got me a foot in the door for other potential conversations or other recommendations about different avenues. And so I think just the ability to learn how to take all of the things that I had been learning in my other classes and apply them, apply them practically when my salary wasn't on the line was probably the most valuable thing that I've taken from this. And for me, I think the biggest thing, and I started off by saying this a little bit, but was the power of community and team work, right? And these are not things that I didn't know, but I actually transferred from another school to the Austin area. And therefore, this was a brand new community for me to be a part of. And both this class and legislative lobbying allowed me to, as someone who cares deeply about civics and civil action and politics, delve, delve into the community's issues and confront them and get to know the game changers and the, and the people that could make change within the community and, and really also learn how to work as a team to, again, even if something doesn't always get done, because as Amy said, a, most, a huge lesson of this is the uh, not important yeah the importance of failure is a lesson in and of itself but 
learning that this is how change is made. And it doesn't matter if you're Democrat, Republican, independent, everybody uses the same tactics to get change in our Republic. And it's vital that we continue to have these conversations, not just in our major, but as young people across the world get more involved throughout our education system, both in higher ed and in high schools. Go civics. As Dr. Thompson was talking about earlier, civics, let me backtrack. In the spring semester, Michael and I both took legislative process and lobbying. And our group of classmates chose to focus on civics education. And as Dr. Thompson said, it became a pretty hot button topic. And so we had to approach it very delicately, but we also were approaching it from a pretty diverse perspective. I'm, I graduated with my degree in psychology and Michael's political science major. We had a social work major on our team. And then we also had differing political ideologies on the team. And so we chose what we didn't think was a very controversial issue. We thought that civics education was a very holistic, should kind of be common sense to learn more about your world and how to interact in it. And then we took differing perspectives and we found a common ground and we were able to embrace the challenge of getting this legislation passed while giving each other grace and handling it with discernment and handling a difficult situation that we found ourselves in. And we're really just able to like kind of get our hands dirty in the community because of how hot the topic became, even though we didn't realize that it would. And then by the end of the semester, Michael, I'm sure you feel the same way. We learned that it was a lot more about making progress and bettering our community than it was about getting a civics bill passed or getting a liberal piece of legislation or a conservative piece of legislation. It was more, here is an item that a group of students with very diverse perspectives and very diverse backgrounds decided was important. And we put all of our skills into getting something done so that we can make our community better. And I think that was really my first taste of what a Holy Cross education is and what it should be. And I think that after experiencing that, it made me much more apt to sign up for the civics lab and to be able to practice that in a very applicable way and really get involved with my community and think, okay, here's what I can do to make the world a better place. And outside of my university and outside of just having things on my resume to apply to grad school or to apply for jobs. But I know, Michael, I'm sure you do too, graduating from St. Ed's with this because of these classes that we've taken we're more well-rounded people and we've made a difference in our local community. So Dr. Thomason, Amy, Michael, um, let me again, just thank you um, very much for sharing your time, your talent, your insights and wisdom tonight with, uh, with our group, with our community. And we know that this is gonna be a great educational piece moving forward for, for our schools community as well, for the network of schools that we work with. So many questions are coming to my mind that I, I wanna ask, you know, as, a, as we, we heard tonight, um, we started off talking about trust and, and all of the things that have led to distrust, right? And, um, I, and, and we talked uh, about the need for, um, for the ability to dialogue and, and especially in this, in this polarized society. And, and then we transitioned a little bit to talk about the value of experiential learning and discovery-based models of learning. And, and if we talk about Holy Cross education, providing the competence to see and the courage to act, right? You just saw that firsthand right here from Amy and Michael, who've gained the competence to, to be um, engaged citizens in this world, empowered leaders in this world, and, and they've built the confidence and, and, and as well the courage to, to be that voice of change. And, and that's really what Holy Cross education is all about. And, um, and so, you know, one of the questions that came to mind, though, and, and it really came right here at the very end, Amy, you were talking about the work that you all did in, in the previous semester, and that you had people in your on your team of differing political backgrounds, political ideologies, and you had to work together, right? You, you, you had to make it, it happen. Um, I, I wonder if you could speak to that experience. You know, is there anything, Dr. Thomason, that you do in creating the environment 
for um, I, that kind of grace-filled uh, discernment, um, respectful dialogue. Um, and, and I just would love to hear some insights on that. I'm curious to see what the students will say about that. What, do, do y'all think, how do you think that works? So I'm, I'm happy to start on this and Dr. Thomason will be too, nice, too humble of himself. So I'll just say it. Yes, he creates a very, very, very comfortable environment for everybody from differing ideologies to talk about. And it's because of those three pillars that he said in the beginning, it's especially accessibility. You know, the whole thought when we would meet, so I, I was in the government relations group and obviously there was a, uh, we'll call it a majority political science, I think particularly within the government relations group. And as Amy said, we were a bunch of different individuals, but the Texas legislature is also built with a bunch of different politically ideological people. And it was all about saying, okay, you know, you're maybe want to do, you maybe are a little bit more of a conservative individual. Well, we got, actually got the little sheet right here. We got HB 3211 done by Representative Bell, who's a more moderate Republican, maybe so-and-so who more aligns with that should go and talk with them and see what type of, where they're at with this. Whereas, you know, you're more of a more liberal leaning individual, maybe we should go talk to Representative James Tallarico who wrote Bill HB 57. And we just, it's all about, I don't wanna say divide and conquer because that seems counterintuitive to the whole idea of working together, but that is what you have to do. You have to say, you know, you have to pick your audience. And I think that's what made it work very well as people from different ideologies were able to work with the legislators they wanted to not only work with then, but also work with legislators that they could see themselves working with postgraduate in making those connections because everybody wants to make connections in these classes, no matter how much you also want to get the goal done, you want to build your connections so that when you are done, you have a contact list that you can say, I need a job and I'm calling James Tallarico. <laughs> I think another aspect of that is so I was also on the government relations team and we were able to have conversations about, okay, so maybe I come from a more conservative view on this bill. I can point out the pros that I see in this as a conservative. And then if somebody else is more liberal, they can point out the pros that they see to that bill as a liberal. And so it helped us to see the arguments from each other's point of view because we had to collaborate on them. And so then that collaboration allowed us to come up with more creative amendments that would be palatable to a wider range of people because we've had these conversations amongst ourselves. We're able to say, okay, here's what a liberal legislature is gonna think of our proposition. Here's what a conservative legislature is gonna think of our proposition. And if we want to have the most success, we need to come up with something that's going to make the most amount of people happy. And so how do we talk amongst ourselves to come up with that solution? And so we really were able to get creative with it. But in order to do that, we needed to have conversations where we were vulnerable and where everybody's opinion was equally valid. And I think that's where Dr. Thompson really came in was to provide a space and kind of facilitate our conversation so that no one group monopolized conversation and everybody felt that what they were saying was just as important as what somebody else was saying. And I think that's really the important aspect that in order to recreate this kind of environment somewhere else, it's going to need to have an instructor that can make people feel that way. And I think Dr. Thompson did a fabulous job of that. And both of you spoke to the, the climate that he established in the class and the comfort level that he brought and the level of mutual respect. And, and, it, and it harkens to me a, a quote by Thomas Aquinas that, that, that says, we must love them both, those whose opinions we share and those whose opinions we reject. For we have labored in the search for truth and both have helped us in the finding of it. And I think it's so important for, for teachers and professors to, to, to be able to create that um, uh, sense of, of comfort, of, of confidence, of confidentiality, of, of support, of safety, right? It becomes as well a, a level of emotional safety. 
psychological safety, that if I have a contrarian viewpoint, um, that, that, uh, that I know that that contrarian viewpoint will at least be supported in my class. And because of the, the, what's been established in the classroom, when I walk out and onto campus or in the hallways, I'll continue to be supported. And so, um, I, so I, I know we've run a little bit over. I, I wonder, we do have one question that's come in um, that uh, Dr. Thomas and maybe you could offer some reflections on. Um, uh, one of our participants tonight is in the process of starting up a micro school, a new Catholic school in New Hampshire, uh, excuse me, in Connecticut. And um, she's interested in civics education at the K to eight level. And, and so I wondered if you could just offer some quick insights on that. Uh, I would say yes. The, the same principles that we have here, kids are also, I mean, middle school to kindergarten, active learning, experiential learning can be fit, it can fit the age, it can be an age appropriate fit. And um, I was at a Y, it's called YMCA government or Y government. Um, I was a judge for their legislature. Um, they do a mock legislature, they write bills and everything. And probably the best student at that event was a ninth grader. And she sounded like she was arguing in front of the Supreme Court. I mean, she was absolutely brilliant. And um, I think we underestimate the ability of students in general, and that we we have to go back to what we said earlier about trust and building that trust. And I think there's that, and as Dr. Clark pointed out, the idea of safety. If we can build a safe environment where students feel comfortable failing and retrying and failing and retrying. I mean, Walt Disney said, everybody needs a good failure early in life. And I think the more we can build in places where people can learn and fail, learn and fail, learn and fail, the more we start to build confidence in overcoming those and then resolving those. And I think the earlier, the better. So I would say start in kindergarten. Uh, an old professor of mine, his name's Jack Crittenden. He wrote a book on civics education um, and it's all about actually from K through 12 um, and applying a lot of what we're, what we're talking about for that, for that age. So it's completely, it's completely in range. And I would highly encourage it. I would be happy to help. I'd be more than happy to help on that. Well, I think and on that note, as, as we begin to come to closure here, um, first off, we'd just like to let everybody know that Dr. Thomason and his students um, will also be uh, offering a workshop, a breakout session at the spring convocation, which is March 24th through the 26th. Um, there'll be an opportunity to engage in additional dialogue there. Certainly, we can help to put you in touch with Dr. Thomason as well if you've got some other questions you'd like to follow up on. Um, can you as well, um, Dr. Thomason, share with us the, the link to the, the podcast that the Civics Lab does? Because I, I think those are all archived, right? Yeah, yeah they are. Uh, you, can, you can either go on any of the podcast platforms, uh, Apple, Spotify, um, any, any of those, or you can just look up uh, the Civics Lab at St. Edwards uh, by Googling it, and you'll pull up, there's 10 or 15 um, podcasts that we, that we have on there. And, uh, and I know I mentioned it earlier, but, but Dr. Clark was on one uh, over the summer on civics and on the, the value of civics uh, with some other groups. Um, and it was a really good one. So um, I'm happy to, 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 to just, just look up Google, Google the Civics Lab at St. Edwards and you'll find the podcast or go on Spotify or any, any platform, Apple. Well, Amy just, just shared it right there. There you go. There, there you go. go. Thank Amy. you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. And and I think um, I so we definitely encourage that you take a look at that. And and again, to reemphasize that Dr. Thomason I, has agreed if, if you've got some questions you want to follow up on, um, he will be uh, doing a presentation at convocation. So what you see on your screen are the four keynote presenters that we have for convocation March 24th through 26th. We just sent out yesterday our first invitation to register for this event. Again, it is a free event. Um, you'll take care of your own accommodations. Uh, we do have room blocks set up in several local hotels. Um, I, you can see that our keynote presenters, Father James Heft, if you're, if you're, I'm sure that you're familiar with Father Heft's work. Um, I just finished reading his most recent book, which, um, which is titled The Future of Catholic Higher Education. Um, he'll be speaking on that book, as well as one he wrote in 2011, The Future of Catholic Education in the United States. 
And then as well, um, he recently co-edited a book um, I called Empty Churches, uh, which really seeks to uh, address the uh, concerns of disaffiliation in the church. Um, and then as well, Alicia Bonadella Simon, who's with Fatica. She's the vice president with Fatica. She's going to speak on um, the state of Catholic philanthropy. Um, so we think that for presidents, board members, advancement people, that'll be a great presentation. Then we have uh, book author Christopher Lowney. Chris Lowney wrote uh, several books, but he'll be speaking specifically on two books. One is called Everyone Leads, How to Revitalize the Catholic Church. And, um, and then his second book uh, that he just came out with is on uh, uh, Pope Francis's leadership style. And so Chris Lowney would be with us. And then Father Tom O'Hara, who is the um, past uh, Superior General, um, a provincial superior, I should say, for the U.S. province of priests. Um, he is former president of King's College, of course, the Holy Cross uh, College, and, um, and he's currently back at King's College working in uh, student support services. He will provide the opening keynote on the 25th of March, um, and he'll be speaking about the apostolic missionary mindset of Holy Cross. And so um, we have six or eight other breakout sessions that'll be happening over the, uh, the course of the two days that we're together. It's a great time of year to be in Austin. We really hope that you uh, take advantage of this and invite from your school communities and from outside of your school communities, um, people to be in attendance um, for this. If you have any questions about convocation, just please shoot us an email uh, and, and we'll get plenty more information out to you about that. Um, and I always like to close with this because really, again, as we speak about this role of what it means to be citizens, right? Empowered leaders inspired by the gospel transforming the world. I'm inspired by this quote by Basil Moreau who says that education is a work of resurrection. It is meant to be a liberation from the darkness of ignorance. It's meant to be a vehicle for the transformation of society. And it's meant to be a process that helps to make all things, especially the persons engaged in it new. And I know that as one who's been engaged with Holy Cross education for many years, um, that I am made new through webinars and um, I, other opportunities to learn with and from our students and, uh, and our colleagues in Holy Cross schools. And so thank you all. Thank you again, Dr. Thomason, uh, Michael, Amy. Amy's a recent grad. She just finished in December. So literally just took her last set of uh, final exams. And, um, and as she said, she's uh, out there looking for a job. So um, if any, any of you might be interested, Amy, I don't know if education's in your future or not, but, uh, but we've got a whole group of educators that are listening to this right now. And then last but not least, um, we always appreciate your feedback on these webinars. And so you can take a snapshot there of that QR code and maybe take a minute or two to complete the evaluation. We always appreciate your feedback. And there's all of our contact information. As we uh, go into now the fourth week of Advent, just know that uh, that you, your family, your communities uh, are in our prayers and, um, and may this time of Advent, which is always a time uh, to reinvigorate hope, right? Uh, as we close out the, the year, go into the Christmas season and we begin again in 2022 as disciples with hope to bring. And so I look forward to seeing all of you in the, in the new year. Please reach out to us. By the way, we will continue in the new year with our webinar series. We'll have more information to follow, but we are the recent recipients of a grant from the Catholic uh, Climate Covenant so two of the featured presentations that will take place in the second half of the year will be focused on um, Laudato Si and Care for Creation. Um, so we look forward to sharing some more information with you about that as well. Okay. And so again, until we meet again, uh, let's remain disciples with hope to bring and have a very Merry Christmas, everybody, and Happy New Year. God bless you.